Hello, and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Before we begin, please hit that like button on all the videos that you watch that you like of mine and all the other creators' videos that you like. It helps so much with the algorithm. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me, and you can also join my Patreon. We are in the midst of a big fundraiser, and I will talk about that at the end of the video. When I rebranded this channel from Dining with Death to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee, I decided to go with a theme that feels authentic to me, which is the West. I did the same thing with my restaurant. I cooked food that was from my heritage and that was successful because it was authentic. So from time to time, I'm going to bring you dark stories from my heritage and from my area because I truly believe that we're all at our best when we're close to authenticity. And when it comes down to it, I'm a hood from the woods, a girl from a very small rural town in Southern Utah. And these are the stories that shaped the place I know the best and the people I know best. Not all Western stories took place in Utah, but the vibe of the Old West is in my DNA. Today I have for you a fascinating story, one that has lived in legend for over a hundred years. This is the story of one of the deadliest families in American history, a literal family of serial killers the Bloody Benders. I'm your host, Stacy Lee. Let's get into it. Our story begins in what was then the western part of the United States, Kansas. The Civil War has been over for five years and the country is not yet in the rebuilding stage. Life is tough. People are dying of disease, they're dying during arguments with their neighbors, and they're dying in fights with Native Americans. Kansas had declared it was with the Union before the war, and once the bloody battles were over, the fight began for control of the new territory. In the years following the Civil War, pioneers began to head from the east to the west, and most of those trails took them right through Kansas. The men and women alike were battle-worn and hardened from the war and from the difficulty of everyday life. The war was over, but the violence was not. Murder and violence persisted among the people who had grown accustomed to seeing some of the most horrific things you can imagine during wartime. Many people had lost a family member in the war and most had lost several. The people were tired and they were beat down, but there was an air of hope the promise of a new era. A lot of families decided to pick up and head to new territories in order to stake their claims somewhere they could own more land. The trails that people were required to take were well marked at this point in time, and some were safer than others. The trails in Southeast Kansas were known to be a particularly rough area. Travelers had to be worried about what were called road agents. Back then, they were basically traveling bandits. They would hide in the hills and wait for a wagon to come by, swoop down on horseback and start shooting in order to steal everything the travelers had. Pioneers also had to be worried about Indian attacks. Those are the words used from that time. Dodge City is often thought of as the roughest, most dangerous place in the Wild West. But as someone who has done a fair amount of research on this topic, I will tell you there were places far worse. Still, Dodge City was bad and Kansas was a rough place. Let me give you some numbers. You had a one in 50 chance of being murdered in Dodge City. That is 20 times higher than the worst city in the world right now. In some towns, the local sheriff began enforcing a law where visitors had to surrender their firearms when entering the town for food or shelter. That worked in some places to keep the peace. I should also tell you that because guns were not what they are today, accidental shootings were very common. It was not uncommon for people to shoot someone in the vicinity on accident and it was even more common for them to shoot themselves. There was a near complete absence of medical care and what was available wasn't good. In this era, the discussion of germs and bacteria was brand new. There was no antibiotics, there were no sanitary practices. Back then, they thought the sign of pus in a wound was a good thing. They thought that meant the wound was cleaning itself, not that the person was dying from infection. <laughs> Something like a stab wound or even a deep cut with a kitchen knife could be a death sentence. A visit to the house of prostitution in town could be the start of a long and painful death, dying of syphilis, or even worse, 
trying to cure the syphilis by drinking mercury. Sometimes the cures were as bad as the disease. The fact of the matter is there simply were not a lot of cures for injury or ailment back then. Cowboys often got trampled by cows. Mines caved in. The steam-powered machinery of the day would often explode. With no electricity and candles being the only source of light at night, houses burning down was a monthly occurrence. There were a thousand ways to die in the Old West, and that was without coming across a family of serial killers. When the Civil War ended, the U.S. government moved the Osage tribe of Native Americans from Labette County in southeast Kansas to the new Indian Territory, as it was called, which would later become the state of Oklahoma. The vacated land in Osage was then portioned out to homesteads, and families that thought they could make a living working those parcels had the opportunity to try and make a go of it. There was also a big movement at this time called spiritualism, and the people who believed in this way of life were called spiritualists. These were people who shunned traditional religion, believing it to be flawed and misleading, Spiritualism, like traditional religion, believes in the immortality of the soul. But unlike traditional religions, it did not call for blind faith. In fact, it required skepticism and people who practiced spiritualism would often conduct things like seances, asking God for proof of the afterlife. Now, the other thing that was very appealing about spiritualism was that women were seen as equals. And honey, that ain't never gonna happen with traditional religion. If a man has magical powers, he's a prophet. If a woman has magical powers, she's a witch. There were years in America where the only time a woman was allowed to speak in public was at a spiritualism event. Female mediums became popular and spiritualists sought them out in order to speak with their loved ones that had passed on. Now, you can imagine knowing about all the death that had so recently occurred in the Civil War. There were many people anxious to communicate with their deceased relatives and family members. What does this have to do with the story? Many spiritualists were drawn to the new territories in order to get away from cities and towns that were dominated by traditional religion. And for this reason, the new territories of places like Kansas were very appealing and groups of spiritualists tend to be the people that migrated there. In 1870, five families of spiritualists loaded up and headed to Labette County, Kansas in order to start their new lives. Their homesteads were about seven miles northeast of where Cherryvale would later be established. Cherryvale came about a year after these homesteads. One of these five families was the Bender family. It was comprised of John Bender Sr., his wife Almira, their son John Jr., and their daughter Kate. It comes as no surprise that these families were very guarded. They were very private and they were very cult-like. Each of the families had similar beliefs and desires but among those desires was the desire to be independent and to live somewhat in isolation. John Bender Sr. was 60 years old when they arrived in Kansas and his wife was 55. These were not young people. They had immigrated from Germany and they spoke with thick German accents when they did speak English. Now again, this is an advanced age to start a homestead, but people back then didn't really have much of a choice. This was a real era of rebuilding. John Sr. was a man of about six foot two. He was a giant of a man, apparently great big broad shoulders. He had deeply set piercing black eyes that sat under huge bushy eyebrows. And people had always called him Old Beetle Brown John. He had a sullen expression all of the time and a thick, heavy beard. The beard was really unkept and so was his long hair. And so he was often described as a wild and woolly man. John's wife, Almira, was known to their neighbors as she devil. Almira was a miserable woman. She was heavy set with a constant look of disdain on her face. She was so unfriendly to her neighbors that they would often turn and go the other way in order to avoid her in town. The two were known as Pa and Ma Bender, and it's safe to say they were not popular in the area. Ma Bender claimed to be a medium who could speak with the dead. She dug up roots to use in potions, and she grew and picked herbs that she would boil in pots. And she claimed she used those materials to cast spells, and she could cast evil spells on people she didn't like. She talked a big game, and she told people in the area that she could do black magic. Her husband, as big and mean looking as he was, was scared of Ma Bender, 
and so was her son. She was a beast of a woman and no one wanted to spend any time around Ma Bender unless they had to. John Bender Jr. was 25 years old. He was tall and slender and handsome. He had auburn hair and a mustache. He spoke English much more fluently than his parents, but he did speak with a slight German accent. John was a much softer man than his father, and he was prone to laughing a lot and laughing at inappropriate times, and that led some people to think he was a halfwit. Those are the words they used. Kate Bender was by far the friendliest of the bunch. She had much better social skills than the rest of her family. She was beautiful, apparently, and she was likable and quick to talk to strangers. At 23, she was very popular and well-known, and she often attended Sunday school where she had a lot of friends. Kate was also a self-proclaimed psychic who had healing powers, according to her. She claimed to possess the ability to speak with the dead. She was so well-liked that she got work on the supernatural lecture circuit, giving speeches about her powers and her abilities to cure sickness and injury. Kate might have been outwardly the nicest bender, but she was the most devious. She wanted to be rich and she wanted to be famous. Her beauty and social skills made her famous in that area, but soon people in the region would be calling her satanic. John Bender Sr. chose a 160 acre section here near what is called the Bender Mounds. I don't know how many of you have been to Kansas, but I'm sure you've heard it's flat. The first time I went to Kansas, I was not prepared. I thought flat meant like rolling hills. No, it's flat, flat, as in flat. Being from Utah, I am used to always being surrounded by the mountains. Everywhere you look in Utah, there is something much, much taller than you are. When I'm in Kansas or North Dakota, places like that, I get this weird feeling that I'm on top of the world or like on top of a mountain because my brain can't quite gather itself being so used to being down in a valley all the time or surrounded by towering mountains. So these mounds, the Bender Mounds are just that. They're like little piles of dirt that are really the only thing close to hills in Kansas. I mean, here in Utah, when somebody digs a basement, you get a pile of dirt this big. <laughs> in Kansas, it's a geographical marker. And these mounds became known, like I said, they are still known as the Bender Mounds. The Benders settled in directly on the Osage Mission Independence Trail to Fort Scott, also called the Great Osage Trail. Here is a map of the main trails at that time. You can see the Independence Trail running from St. Louis. John Bender Sr.'s son, John Jr., chose a sliver of narrow land just north of his father's, but he never homesteaded it. After establishing their homestead, the Bender family got to work, and soon they had built a small one-roomed cabin along with a barn and a corral for the horses. Then they dug a well, which of course is the most important thing you have to have on your land, water. The Benders kept to themselves. From the outside, they seemed to be a simple family struggling to work their homestead, breaking their backs in order to earn a very hard living, just like the other pioneers in the area. In 1871, the Benders opened a store attached to a small inn. This was a great business move because there were lots of travelers passing right by their homestead as they traveled the Great Osage Trail. This is a photo of the actual inn. It's really just their one room cabin. It sure doesn't look like much, but I'd bet if you'd been sitting in a wagon and sleeping on the ground for a long time, it looked like heaven. Travelers began stopping at the Bender Inn and word spread along the trail that there was a new resting stop with good food and decent beds, and it was a welcome addition to those making the long and grueling trek to the new west. Travelers would stop to have a meal or to buy supplies. You have to remember when people set out for the west literally everything they owned was with them. Everything they couldn't pack up and carry had been sold. And what did that mean? The families were carrying with them large sums of cash. Cash they made by selling off most of their possessions. The benders knew this. The benders knew people coming through had cash to spend and they knew the people would be in need of supplies. The Bender Inn was a necessary and helpful stop on that journey. So the Benders sectioned off the front part of their cabin as a sleeping area for the visitors when they had them. And then when the visitors were in the front of the cabin, the Benders would stay in the back and they would hang a sheet, a piece of a covered wagon, you know, the actual cloth from the covered wagon, and that would be the divider in the home. Everyone would sleep on small cots, and soon people were calling the rest stop the Wayside Inn. Many people found it helpful and necessary on their journey, but there was just one problem. Some people who checked in to the Wayside Inn never checked out. 
The first few travelers that went missing did not raise much of an alarm. This was the Wild West, the frontier. People go missing all the time. But as more time passed, the disappearances became more and more frequent. Travelers would check in with their relatives by mail in the town before stopping at the vendor's place, the, way, the wayside inn, and those relatives that had heard from them would never hear from them again. So it's like, we got a postcard, we got a letter a couple of weeks ago, and they told us they were going to be arriving at their destination. Well, a couple of weeks have gone by, three weeks have gone by, four weeks have gone by, nothing. It started to feel like more than a coincidence. By the spring of 1873, just two years after the Benders opened their inn, there were rumors flying around the area. Some people said that the portion of the trail was cursed, that when the government forced the Native Americans off of their land, those people left behind a curse that would befall all who traveled it. There was talk of demons and skinwalkers and a great and hairy beast who was snatching travelers off the trail. Then travelers began to avoid that section of the trail altogether. And this made other homesteaders angry because they too had set up stops to sell their wares to those passing through. Neighbors in the communities around the Bender homestead started to make accusations. There wasn't much government set up in those days, but there was a small governing body called the Osage Township. In March of 1873, a meeting was called to be held at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse. The purpose of the meeting was to talk about what was happening in the region and what, if anything, could be done about it. 75 area people showed up for that meeting. Among them was John Bender Sr. and John Bender Jr. The discussion began over the disappearance of a very well-known Independence, Missouri doctor named William H. York. Dr. York had some very upset family members and they were wealthy, influential, and they wanted to know what was going on. Dr. York left his brother's home at Fort Scott, Kansas and headed back to his home in Independence. A week went by and the doctor's brother became concerned when all of his posts to Independence went unanswered. Dr. York's brother was a colonel in the army and he decided to set off and trace his brother's footsteps. When Colonel York came to the Wayside Inn, he spoke with the Benders, asking them if they had seen his brother. No, the Benders said, they hadn't had a guest in weeks. The Osage Township leaders did not want their area to become known for scandal, and they intended to do what they had to do in order to find the doctor and others that had gone missing. At this meeting at the schoolhouse, it was decided that search groups would be formed and every farmstead and homestead between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek would be searched and searched well, not just for missing people, but for bodies. The people of the Osage area were well aware something very nefarious was happening in their area. They just weren't sure what it was. The two Bender men, father and son, sat quietly in this meeting and didn't speak a word. But when they were asked if their homestead could be searched, they said yes. The searches began and went on for days and then a week and then two. Finally, it was time to search the Bender property. When the search party got to the Bender homestead, members were shocked and angry to see the animals skinny and unfed and the homestead abandoned. A neighbor of the Benders, a man named Billy Toll, told searchers that he had contacted the town trustee, a man named Leroy F. Dick, and informed him that the Benders were gone. Members of the search party were immediately angry, like I said, that the animals had been left there to starve, tied up even. Then the searchers saw that the front door to the little cabin was padlocked. Somebody didn't want them inside. The searchers broke the padlock off the door and let themselves inside the cabin, and it was empty. The food, the clothing, the personal possessions were all gone. There was something present though, something very, very present, and that was a terrible odor. It was an odor that most of the men had become all too familiar with during their time in the war, the odor of death and rotting bodies. There in the middle of the tiny ramshackle cabin was a trap door in the floor. It was nailed shut. One of the men in the search party found a crowbar and together they pried it open. A smell shot out of the opening that sent the men running outside where they were sick. After the air cleared to the point that the men could stand to be in the room, they went back inside and peered into the hole in the floor. There they found a six foot deep pit and it was filled with clotted blood. 
there was a large pool of drying blood in the center of the pit, and the sides of the pit had pooled blood in the corners. Some of that blood had been there for a while, yet it hadn't dried all the way. Something must have been on top of the blood to prevent it from drying completely. After going through the pit and the cabin, it was decided that the entire cabin would be picked up and moved off of its foundation. The men used ropes and their own strength to push the cabin off its shaky foundation and to the side about 10 feet. They knew they had to look everywhere underneath this cabin, but they found nothing more than drying clotted blood. The searchers began to dig around the perimeter of the cabin and the perimeter of the foundation as well. The benders had planted a little vegetable garden off to the side of the cabin, and there was also several fruit trees. It was there in the orchard that they found him. As search party members moved the dirt near the garden around, they discovered Dr. William H. York, face down, buried so shallowly that his feet were barely covered with dirt. His skull had been bludgeoned and his throat had been slit from ear to ear. Ed York reached down and turned his brother's body over. He was pretty sure it was him, but he wanted to make sure. He used his shovel to sever the head and then he washed the face clean. It was in fact his brother, Dr. William York. It was getting dark at this point, so the men set up camp at the site and they waited for daybreak. The following day, they continued to dig. It started to rain, so they had to stop. By the time the rain broke, the area police had arrived. The digging began again. Ed York, the doctor's brother, was there digging right along with the search party, and suddenly he yelled, boys, I see graves. The other men came running to where Ed was standing. There was a large rectangular depression in the earth among the small fruit trees. The men began digging all at once with their shovels and their spades clanging against each other. Before long, several of the men were saying they were hitting something hard. And one man said, this ain't a rock. They slowed down and began to dig a little more carefully. And then they uncovered a body, then another and another. None of the bodies belonged to Ma or Pa Bender, to John Jr. or to Kate. So all doubts that the Benders might be victims vanished and they knew they'd been living with a family of monsters in their midst. Before long, the searchers had uncovered 10 bodies in the orchard, including that of Dr. York. Among the bodies were those of George Launcher and his daughter. George's skull had been crushed into pieces. It was a gruesome sight, but it was nothing compared to that of George's eight-year-old daughter. The girl had suffered a broken arm, but her skull was intact. She had not been bashed like the other victims. She did, however, have a scarf tied tightly around her neck and it was determined that she had been buried alive. I just, you know, people want to talk about how the world has gone to hell in a handbasket. I just think those people don't know much about history because people have always been vile and evil. Then the men found the body of Henry McKenzie, who had stopped at the Benders around November 6th, 1872, on his way to see his sister in Independence. Henry, too, had his skull crushed, and it was then that a theory began to form. Inside the cabin hung that sheet that I mentioned earlier that separated the dining area and the traveler cots from the back of the cabin where the benders would sleep. On that sheet and around that sheet, there were signs of blood. The police began to believe that John Bender Sr. would wait until the travelers were seated at the dining room table, which backed up against the cloth sheeting. John Bender Sr. would then sneak up behind the travelers as they ate. He would stand behind the sheet and then take an iron-headed hammer and bash their skulls in as they sat at the table. The searchers then found Ben Brown, W.F. McCrotty, and John Greary. They also found a missing man named Johnny Boyle who was sitting upright in a shallow grave. The rest of the 10 bodies that they found have never been identified. How many people did the Bloody Benders kill between 1871 and 1873? No one knows. Most people who have studied this case believe the number to be more than 20. Those same people believe that the Benders stole over $5,000 from their victims. That's the equivalent of $118,000 in today's money. The horrific fines shook the people who lived around Harmony Grove and Cherryville. Yes, the people were mortified, but they were also angry. They wanted someone to pay for these terrible acts. The benders had vanished into thin air. Lawmen from Kansas and from neighboring states searched for the family, but they were never found. 
A man named Rudolf Brockman took the brunt of the community anger. Rudolf had courted Kate Bender, but swore he knew nothing about the murders. A mob actually gathered and threw a noose around this poor man's neck and jerked him upwards, letting him down slowly and then jerking him upwards again, even until he passed out. They didn't kill him and Rudolph never changed his story. He didn't know anything. A Salem witch trials fever gripped the area. Even the town preacher was interrogated. Ed York put up a thousand dollar reward for any information leading to the arrest of just one of the bloody benders. The fervor died down and then the curiosity set in. Relic hunters went to the bender property and took pieces of the cabin as souvenirs. It said there was even a fight over the piece of wood that said open on one side and groceries on the other. Sometimes there were thousands of people at the homestead over the weekends. Before long, the whole entire little cabin had been carried away bit by bit by relic hunters. For years, reports would come in of a tall young man with a slight German accent here or there, a pretty young woman with a slight German accent working as a washerwoman at this hotel or that hotel, but not a single trace of the Bloody Benders was ever found. The Bloody Benders have not been forgotten. In Cherryvale, there was a museum dedicated to the family that opened in 1961. It closed down in 1978, but these amazing photos are remaining. There were creepy mannequins that represented the benders. This is Kate behind the counter. This is an unsuspecting traveler waiting to be bludgeoned by John Sr. I would have loved to see this place. I, I know there's something wrong with me. I'm well aware, but I like this macabre stuff. <laughs> That's why I'm so comfortable with you guys because I know a lot of you are like me. <laughs> now that the museum is closed, there is only a little room about the bloody benders in the Cherryvale Museum. It includes the actual murder weapon, the hammer, along with a wreath made from the little nine-year-old victim's hair. They had a real thing for hair back then. I have a TikTok friend, her account is Mama Macabre, and that's macabre, you know how you spell macabre. If you like things like this, go to her TikTok account. She has so many old photos of how they used to like prop people up after they were dead and take pictures with them, you know, and the hair art that they would make from their dead relatives and stuff. Her account's really cool. Most likely, we will never know what happened to the bloody benders. Did they leave the country? Did they spend the rest of their lives looking over their shoulders? I hope so. Whatever became of them, this bloodthirsty family of serial killers will live in the annals of American lore for as long as these stories are told. The bloody benders will go down in history, especially among the people of Kansas, who still tell folks that the term going on a bender has a whole different meaning there. Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. You can also join my Patreon. We are in the midst of a fundraiser. This is the thumbnail for the video that will tell you all about the fundraiser. We are raising money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that have never been tested. Watch this video and it will tell you all about it. You don't have to donate 20 bucks. You can donate a dollar. You can Venmo me. You can buy me a coffee. You can PayPal. You can cash at me. It all goes to the cause. I've got a little spreadsheet and you will see all the donations with all of your names when we raise enough money. I sure appreciate you all. You guys and your kind comments have kept me going through what has been a slow period here on the channel. And I just want to thank you. I know I say this all the time, but I wouldn't still be doing this if it wasn't for you guys. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.